Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii Studios for the, another exciting episode of Security Matters. Uh, today, we have the amazing Rebecca Bain with us from uh, Bain Consulting and Search. Um, she is out of Denver, and uh, we're going to dig into what's kind of flexing in the industry. There's um, a lot of people doing well and a lot of people not doing well, and I think things are moving around, and Rebecca is one of those people that keeps her finger on the pulse of things. So I'm looking forward to an, an insightful uh, episode here today. Rebecca, thanks for joining me. I know you're busy out there, and it's a busy time for all of us in the industry. Um, how are, you, how are you and your team doing out there? Our team is doing great, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me on your program. Um, we're so thankful. We have big open office space, so we've been able to work entirely through this thing. And thankfully, all of our families, our close circles of friends, we're all good. So we're awesome. Thankful. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Well, many of our audience will know you, but um, for those who may not, um, Give us your, um, you know, as much of your history as you care to share and kind of bring us up through the, the development of bank consulting and search and, you know, kind of bring us into the present day and then we'll go from there. Okay, I would love to. So bank consulting and search was born from my previous career working for another company, another recruiting firm in the industry, SCW Consulting. I was with SCW Consulting for 13 years mm -hmm. and um, after 13 years, approached the owner, Tom Virgil, and asked him if he would be willing to sell me the portion of the business that I'd helped him build, which was focused on integration. And during that 13 years, I focused entirely on security integrators with a, a team of other people who uh, we all worked together and, and focused on that space. And Tom was willing to do that. And it's been a fantastic journey ever since. Um, the company was founded on April 1st, 2013. So we just had our seventh anniversary. Ah, congratulations. Yes. And you, I know you've got um, three or three or four um, that you're, you're training and you've had some for a while now. So how's, uh, how's that development piece going in the, I mean, we, we've been through some flux in the industry. So how's, uh, how's, is it a good training opportunity of, available for them to learn? So I think that recruiting is a challenge. It's, it's never an easy job. Um, Lindsay Mayu has been with me for going on six years at this point, and uh, Kelly Latimer has been with me for a little over four. Nicole Riggs has almost been with us for three. We've had a few others come through here, but really not many. It's, it's, it's typically a thing that you love and you really embrace and you make it a part of your life because we deal with people's lives every day. Yeah. Um, well, let's get to some of these, um, some points that we talked about a little bit earlier, but the, um, what's, what's one of the keys that you think that for the companies that you know that are doing well and companies like yourselves, you know, what, what sort of brought you through? So I would have to say that um, the, the companies that I see that are making it through this time right now, Andrew, um, somewhat unscathed, I don't think anyone is coming through this without feeling the impact. They are companies that had a very, very deep connection with their teams and their people, had strong cultures, first and foremost, so that when modifications had to happen, everyone bought into that. And those modifications were fair and reasonable. Sure. Um, I also think that business models had a lot to do with it. Hmm. Your company is a good example of that, since you and I do work together. Sure. Yeah, we had. Um, well, I know we we talked about this this whole idea of positivity, and, and Christine's done a a a, a job here, kind of getting information out daily and trying to give it a you know keep everybody aware of what's going on, you know, with the local government's position and our our clients' position on things, but then giving it a positive spin. Um, to, I, I think that helps you know with motivation. Um, are, have you seen other folks sort of just trying to emphasize the? The, you know, the path forward is what we have, we have to focus on and we can't, you know, control a lot of what's happening around us. Yes, definitely. I think that um, one example of a company that I've seen do that, um, they, they were always very proactive from the beginning about being vocal with their teams. And I think that all of my clients and the integrators that I've spoken with in the past two months who have done the best again, were very vocal and transparent about what they were going through and talked about ideas and, and shared the thoughts on what could um, be put forth as options to keep as many people employed. 
So some people voluntarily, of course, decided to go home and maybe only work part-time schedules. But um, in some cases, companies took uh, 40 hours of PTO and told everyone, please go take 40 hours of PTO. And everyone signed up for that. In some cases, people took salary cuts across the board. Some of those companies have already reinstilled those salary cuts. And I think that one of the really more critical things about positivity with companies is that if teams or specific employees are not comfortable coming back yet, Andrew, those owners are being very conscientious about not pushing people. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some people who are dying to get back to the office and there are some who just absolutely don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the, the guidance is unclear, right? I mean, you know, contagions, going to come and go. We kind of all know the future. I think it's kind of scary for some. I understand that. Um, what about this, this generation of folks in our workforce that have never probably maybe even seen sort of a downtime? You know, it's such a strong growth industry. Yeah. Uh, something like this could be absolute shock if you're early on in your career. Maybe you weren't around in 08, 09, or, you know, definitely not in 2000. You know, I've been through a few of those, but um, what do you think about that generation? What can we do to sort of encourage them or help at least, you know, kind of help to understand what they may be going through? Because it's probably different than some of some of what are, those of us who survived some of those things. It is. I'll, I'll share the example of what happened in my own office here. Um, I, I hope Lindsay's OK with this. But <laughs> Lindsay is, is my millennial and she literally at the be beginning of this thing was just I, I think she was um, just couldn't believe that something this big could be happening in our world. And she was just, you know, like coming in every day with a smile on her face and, oh, this isn't that big of a deal. And then one day it hit her. She was watching enough news reports or seeing the impact globally. And, and she was a, a bit of an emotional wreck for about a week. She just couldn't wrap her head around the thing. And she said to me, Rebecca, even in the last recession, I didn't feel that. I was just getting out of school. I was, you know, working at Home Depot. Things were different and easier. And now she's really seeing the impact on her own family, on her mother, on her friends. And so it was an eye opener for me to stop and say, wow, this generation has not gone through this. Whereas you and I, we've gone through three, four recessions maybe. And I, I had to stop and realize how aware I need to be of how she's viewing this. Um, I've got a couple of other um, employees who are in the next generation, older. They're a little bit more calm with it because they've seen some other things, but it's different for people based on their age, undoubtedly. Yeah, the, um, you know, the, do you think there's a um, sort of a, a message of consistency that we can share with them about the strength of our industry? I mean, you know, Last time, I remember for sure, 08, 09, it was, it was interesting. We were doing a lot of grant money work for the state, but all the other projects that slowed down just came roaring back because security gets like this pent-up demand. Yeah. Um, and and it, so it, the need never goes away. It's just it's kind of a when, not an if sort of thing once companies decide to do this. Um, is, is you think the younger members of our, of our industry can take some comfort in that and, and believe in it? Or do you think they, they're like, ah, you know, they don't trust us yet. <laughs> well, I think, I think that we, we've always talked about the fact that security is somewhat recession proof. We're not uh, impervious to the impacts of that. And especially with what's happening here, this is a different situation than a recession in the United States. However, um, they're not just hearing that from me. And then when we speak to other people in the industry and other young people in the industry, they're hearing it from the publications. They're hearing it from the old souls like you and me um, talking about what we've been through in the past. And so, no, I think that there definitely is some comfort in that. Um, unfortunately, in some cases, crime goes up in these situations, right? Yeah. So we've had some clients talking to us about scenarios where they're more needed now than they were before. Um, but it, it, a lot of this has yet to be told. I had a conversation with Dean Reese at Reese uh, Security in Portland. And, you know, he said, because he does a lot of work in the public space, they're really not feeling a huge impact right now. But he knows that because public space is funded by taxes, 
um, that there could be some other kind of impact down the road that we can't foresee right now. So we'll see what happens as we move forward 2021. I think it's one day at a time, one week at a time, one month at a time. Yeah, for sure. The, um, you know, back to this empathy question, do you, have you seen any, anybody doing sort of, um, anything you more, a little more unique to help, um, maybe calm the, some of the nerves of some of our workforce? Cause some of this, this workforce is young and brilliant and, you know, we don't want to lose them. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, uh, you know, they may, uh, they, if, if, if they're not getting, um, you know, if you weren't, or if, if an owner was unable to maybe kind of provide for them during these last month or two or, or keep them confident, um, they may be thinking about moving on, you know, so is, have you seen anybody do anything really unique to sort of address that, that younger sort of, of, um, let's not call them afraid, but the group that's concerned for their, you know, their own well-being first, maybe a little more ahead than the company. They're going through it for the first time, Andrew, again, some, mm. of, some of those younger people. So two things. Uh, in, in one case, um, I have a client here in Denver, SIS, uh, Ruben Orr's company, and he, he said that a few of his younger employees came to him and just said, you know, Ruben, this is, this is a great opportunity for me to reassess my life. I may not walk away from security entirely, but right now I want to take a couple of months and I'm going to take a sabbatical and I'm going to go out to wherever, California or wherever, and be with my friends, my dearest friends and family wow. through this. And he was supportive to them because uh, you're, not, you're not going to keep someone by threatening them or not allowing them to do that. Those sure. people will probably come back to him eventually. Uh, another thing that I'm seeing is um, as far as conferences and sessions and, and things that can be beneficial to the younger generation in our industry. I'm involved in the RISE group through SIA, oh. through SIA, and we have a conference that was supposed to happen in Austin in late July. We've the, they're, they're right now trying to figure out what they're going to do with that conference and if something can be done in a different scenario, a different way, maybe virtually. Um, there are so many ways that you can reach out to the younger generation and Accelerize and Rise in our industry specifically, I think is going to be very important and probably more impactful now than it's been in the past. Yeah, that group is, I think, over 800 today. It's pretty big, yes. It's gotten big, so I can imagine all of the owners are going to want to uh, present, if possible, you know, or talk to them. I mean, what a, what a, um, you know, just what a wealth of, of of young industry knowledge and industry motivation that we all we all know how their their outlook is, you know, different and positive, and we we need those refreshing voices. You know, I've met several of those groups already. Um, so there, that show may go virtual as well. I think that right now they have to consider it because I, we, we're not open. We're not sure. really fully open. And I don't know about bringing a group of people together. Yeah. Um, little plug there. One of the most amazing, unique approaches to a conference that I've ever attended. So we were a, a platinum sponsor last year. We're going to sponsor again this year. We need that young talent in our industry, don't we? Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Good stuff. Well, let's, um, we're coming up to a good sort of midway point. So we have to pay some bills. We take about a one minute break. We'll let Eric uh, take us to the break and uh, we'll be back in one minute with Rebecca Bain. Aloha, I'm John David and the host of History Lens on Think Tech Hawaii. History Lens deals with contemporary events and looks at them through a historical perspective or what we call a history lens. Uh, the show is streamed live on thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo and aloha. Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Security Matters. We're speaking with Rebecca Bain of Bain Consulting and Search, and we're kind of going through what's flexing in the industry. It's a tumultuous time, especially if you've never been through it before. Uh, Rebecca, we were talking about the 
the rise of the virtual event. You know, it's like um, it's it's I find it more difficult personally. I mean, I'm staring into these boxes. I call them Hollywood squares. A lot of people don't even remember Hollywood, that show, you know, Hollywood squares. But I feel like it's even more intense because you have to really focus on looking at people. And it's it's a lot of work. I mean, I think our productivity is up, actually, I'd say, as a result of it. Do you think that we can take these virtual conference events and, and make them even more productive? I don't know if we can make them more productive. I think there will be a different kind of impact or benefit that comes from those. Andrew, obviously you can do a lot more with um, media and advertising and, and, and putting a message out that way, but I don't think it will ever be the same as being with those people face to face. Yeah. Um, a, a little side note about the amazing increase in requirement for Zoom meetings. Uh, there, there's another company that I work with in Southern California, Olivier. They were already a virtual company in many respects in that uh-huh. they all worked from home, right? So Louis Bulgaridis, the, the president there, didn't want people to have to commute in Southern California. We can understand why. And so when this happened, they didn't have to make any modifications or pivot to get people home. However, suddenly all of their customers wanted to do Zoom meetings and Lewis said, I, I'm doing more Zoom meetings than I've ever done. And he said, I just finally, I had to say, hey, guys, we don't have to always see each other like this. So <laughs> it's a little exhausting. I agree with you. But back to the, the, the concept of conferences, I, I think that I, I heard recently that Genetech did a very successful virtual conference. Mm-hmm. And I didn't see that. But, um, you know, with, with really outstanding technology and games and all kinds of little virtual rooms and things like that. I don't think it's ever going to be the same. I I hope that we're able to get back to being together in person within six months. Sure. A year. Mm -hmm. Could be a while. I know that those of us that have been around a while, we've built relationships. We look forward to getting to these conferences and seeing each other and catching up. And I mean, I'm missing that myself, although I've seen a lot of people virtually it's definitely it's not the same and you know from hawaii you know me i always i hug everybody well that that's going away for sure (laughs) so like um i uh we did play a we played a jeopardy game and we've done a few things you know just with our team and i mean i do think that the opportunity to leverage a lot of this technology that that maybe we avoided because we were more comfortable just meeting and shaking hands and doing what we'd always done you know, I would expect to see a lot more of this sort of virtual activity, maybe even at a booth, you know, where, you know, you've got some virtual stuff going on along with the live stuff, sort of a hybrid thing. I, I, I can't imagine what it's going to be like when we come back, but I can't imagine we leave this behind. No, I can't imagine either. Um, RFI in, in Northern California, uh, Deanne Harn, again, the, the president there told me that when she moved a meeting that they were doing twice a week in person to a Zoom meeting, everyone got more efficient about what they wanted to cover. And so now that twice a week meeting has actually gone down to a once a week meeting. Oh. And it's fine for everyone, but she had to invest a lot of time and effort in giving getting her team super familiar with and comfortable with the technology because mm-hmm. a lot of people have never done this, right? Yeah. Especially sure. Yeah, we, we had used Teams, but we weren't all that familiar with it, right? So it didn't take long. I mean, it's now it's everything. And, and we're now, we went the other direction where we, we huddled every morning. The, um, that's, uh, I forget what principle that is, but we used to have a standing huddle, 15 minutes. So, you know, if I need help from ops or ops needs help from sales, whatever it could be, you get somebody to commit to helping you to solve whatever your issue is, right? And uh, so we, we moved that to twice a day virtual, but it's still short. And, um, you know, there's nothing remains on the stuck board that's not kind of waiting on a customer. So, you know, I've been happy with that. And, uh, you know, it's everything's in teams now, kind of, you know, which is fun. I mean, it's a far more functional tool than than the meetings we used to have in person. I just have to say that, you know, that's been my experience of it. Um, what have you heard of other um, maybe innovative um, approaches Some anything else that, uh, you know, comes to mind that other You've seen other companies working on that have been successful and helped them kind of get through this or something that grew out of the doing of it virtually? Well, the, the only other thing that I think I would share is that um, knowing that there's always a certain team aspect to what security integrators do in the field, right? And, and trying to figure out how do you shift 
it's still be effective in the field if you need a team working together and, and you have to be aware of social distancing and, and all of those various aspects. Um, I, I think, again, addressing it, um, you know, Brian View at VTI said to me, it's, we love our work. It's not the, the work that we're losing or that we don't have enough work to do, but we're wondering how can we still be as impactful and, and get as much satisfaction out of this when we're not all together all the time. So they're, mm. they're trying to find ways to do that and very slowly bringing people back to the office. I, I, I think that there's no magic wand where we're really going to have to just see how this thing goes. Sure. And, determine what how much more we can do and how much we have to maybe dial things back if we move too quickly yeah yeah it's, I, think, I think there'll be a bit of a yo-yo effect for sure yeah. um well let's get into what i think a lot of the viewers really going to want to know about is what's happening with the workforce <laughs> yeah. so are they um well i'm sure it's varied you know different spots different things regional things what uh what can you share with us about your observations of the workforce like today just compared to you know, maybe this time last year, but definitely, you know, two or three months ago. Well, uh, I, I'll be straight up. We lost about 80% of the search assignments we were working on to an on hold status. Uh, surprisingly, none of the searches that we were working on, and we work with a myriad of companies from large global integrators to the very small mom and pop companies, and nothing was 100% canceled. We have a number of positions though, just be put on hold and slowly those are all being released and they're, they're bringing those back active. We've been very supportive to our clients at the same time that if they have people who are furloughed that they can shift and put into those roles that they should do that. And a number of positions have been filled that way. So oh. they can stretch people a little bit further or bring a skill set over to a new role rather than hire someone from the outside and then have to furlough someone or lay, lay them off for good. Uh, a, a number of our clients are doing that. I will tell you though, that we're still filling positions and companies that are diverse and didn't put all their eggs in one basket in one vertical um, are definitely doing the best as are companies that work in the public space, state, local government, and then education, of course, and FedGov. So yeah. we, we're very busy with companies that do that sort of work. Surprisingly also, um, or maybe not so surprisingly, fire-related technologies, which are part of our life safety industry, um, mm -hmm. those, those all have to be supported. You still have to have companies protecting their buildings and their people, if there are people in there, but there's a lot of other property in those facilities that has to be protected by fire technology. So mm -hmm. fire's not going away either. It might've slowed down a bit, but it's not going away. Yeah, Lee, even construction here, they that was an immediate push to keep construction going uh, from the General Contractor Association, from the city, the state. They, in fact, accelerated projects to because that's that's about the only source of income in our economy out here. Now, the rest was all tourism. Um, have you heard? Is that this a similar thing is new construction as far as, you know, you know, going forward? Some states completely locked down construction sites. Oh. Wouldn't, wouldn't let anyone on construction sites. I know that that happened in Washington state. It happened in California. Um, I, I don't know a lot others off the top of my head, but there are some areas where no one was allowed on a construction site. Mm. Um, I know that in New York City, just because of the very nature of the population there and the impact of COVID, there was a lot more that went into lockdown there as well. But where construction sites could be open, Projects have continued to move forward, thankfully. Yeah. Um, have you heard from owners? Do they do they feel like we'll be uh, kind of what I alluded to earlier, that the, that demand will be pent up and that we will be doing all these projects? It's just kind of, they're all just kind of delayed. Is that, the, do you, you know, can you resonate with that sort of a, of a opinion? Definitely, and not just opinion. Um, there are some very specific timelines that have been fed back to integrators with projects that they have where literally the customer just said, we're moving that to a start date in August. Okay. Or September, whatever the case might be. So there's just a temporary freeze on the project. Um, of course, you know, anything can happen between now and then. But I don't know that anyone is foreseeing any kind of a major boom. Um, I feel like the impact of this is bigger that it's going to be a very slow revival mm -hmm. and then we're just going to be pacing ourselves. And yeah, yeah if, 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 if people don't get back to work and companies don't reopen, 
it's going to be very slow. I, sure. I agree with you that it's not going to go away. It has never gone away. Yeah. Is, um, are there sectors of our industry that you think w won't make it? Are there integrators who are living, you know, they made their money off hospitality or off, you know, are they gone, do you think? Or have you seen, have you heard of companies closing? I mean, in Hawaii, the security companies, by and large, are still here. You know, I don't know who all is busy, you know, um, but across the country, what, what uh, what's your, what, what's that picture look like from your perspective? I don't have any clients. I don't know any companies that were 100% dependent on hospitality, but often they were um, dependent on hospitality. And then a near neighbor industry is often retail. Right. Companies like that. So they definitely have felt the largest impact. They're taking in the example from companies like yours and others that have a lot more work with public sector, critical infrastructure, FedGov, and, um, and, and I'm, I'm, of course, talking to those companies about really trying to open up themselves to exploring those possibilities as things move forward. There's a lot of work out there for companies that can do that. Yeah, I hope um, many of them have always been amazed. They say, oh, we tried government and all the bureaucracy, blah, blah, blah. But if you, if you wade through that, you'll find that if you're, I think if you're an important part of the national security strategy, then, you know, when national security is in the spotlight, you're busy, you know, that's kind of what we experienced. Yeah. We've got a minute or so left. Um, share with our audience what uh, what you'd like them to know about going forward, and uh, you know what uh, what what you know a little bit of what you folks are going to do going forward. The, the the biggest statement that I'd like to make about how we all go forward, holding each other up, Andrew, is to stay positive. Be one of the most um, I, I don't even know the word to use disappointing things that I've experienced is that as soon as this thing came down, people were calling me and everyone was talking about everyone with no real sense of what was true and what was false. Mm -hmm. So please, let's be positive. Let's, let's look for the good things that companies are doing, the wins that we're still all getting. Let's hold each other up. Let's share good, positive information. And um, we'll make it through this. I, we have to be positive. I agree a hundred percent. Thank you so much for that wisdom. I hope people are listening out there. Rebecca, thanks for taking the time to share with us today. It was a great interview and I uh, hope, I hope I get to see you in person soon. If not, we'll just zoom it up again. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Take care. Aloha. And out there in TV land, take care. We'll see you soon next Tuesday. Aloha everybody.